You know, it just takes a really long time to see progress. I think that's probably the biggest lesson I'm taking away from all of this is we are seeing change. We're seeing positive change, but it takes a really long time for minor changes to happen. And then all of a sudden it's a big one. Hey y'all, welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Erin. And I'm co-host Ange, aka Captain Party. And for more than 10 years, the show has celebrated underrepresented voices in pop culture and beyond. But not in a snore kind of way. And that's why our listeners and followers voted us 48 Hills Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022 and 2023. Correct. And we're pushing for that 2024, (laughs) y'all. If you like what you hear, follow us on Instagram and check out our website, bitchtalkpodcast.com. And please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Honestly, we know you love judging people. We're asking you, (laughs) judge us. Judge us. Help us. And now, on with the show. Clink. All right, Bitch Talkers, we are so excited to have a couple of gals that uh, I know we've been following for a long time. Uh, their names are Amy Gutierrez, also known as Amy G, to Giants fans, and Anika Orak, who is an illustrator, cartoonist, all-around badass bitch. Thank you so much for being on Bitch Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down the best intro I've ever received. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both are bad bitches. Oh, good. I was feeling left out. I'm like, oh. I guess I'm not oh. Amy, you're an OG bad bitch. When your last name is just an initial, that's like understood. It's like you don't You've even have it. to explain it. You have made it in life. <laughs> We are here to talk about a book called Smarty Marty Takes the Field, Um, and I wanted to have Amy, um, Amy G, introduce the book and um, maybe a little bit of the origin story of it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us on. I'm super excited. It's great to see Anika because we're not in the same state, so we don't get to see each other very often. But Smarty Marty Takes the Field is is my fourth publication. Um, It originated back in... 2012, when Cameron and Company, a local publishing um, publisher here in my hometown of Petaluma, approached me about writing a children's book about baseball. And as you guys know, as Giants fans, we were headed to the playoffs, and uh, it was not on my radar at all to be an author. And so I said, No, I go, No, I don't want to do any of this. And <laughs> my sweet, sweet grandmother. Uh, was on hospice at the time. And I went to go visit her after this meeting that I had and told her, I'm like, can you believe they want me to do this? I don't know how to do this. I don't have time. Do they know what we're covering with the giants right now? And she, in her little deathbed, she goes, you got to do it. You got to write this book. And so I had this kind of epiphany at that time through my grandmother, who was the biggest baseball fan I've ever known. Unfortunately, her only flaw was she was a Dodgers fan. Um, I got I got from the bay. Yeah, I got her to like the the Giants by the end. By then, she really liked Pablo Sandoval. Um, And I decided, what if I did do this? And I named the main character was a girl, so we have a heroine finally in baseball. And I named her after my grandmother. So Marty is named after my grandmother, Martha. And so that's kind of how the idea was born. Each book's been a little bit different. And this latest book, Marty Marty Takes the Field really dives into gender stereotypes and opportunity and that whole, you know, cliche of you're not qualified. How do you get qualified if you're never given an opportunity to try something? It's really hard as a female to build any equity if you're never given an opportunity to show what you can do. So little Smarty Marty, who's remained the same age in all of our books, uh, she gets a chance to manage a little league game and deals with the adversity from the team and uh and her own insecurities and trying to take on that role and as always we have a strong family in the book and a lot of great advice and a little uh, nod to Alyssa Nacken who uh, gave us permission to use her likeness in the book as kind of the mentor for Marty and telling her I went through similar things you can do this this happens to us all the time at Bitch Talk. I'm always like, I'm so jealous of kids that get to grow up with books like this and, and with Aww. heroes to look up to that look like them. Uh, this is the third book in the Smarty M- Marty series, but this is Anika's first time illustrating it. Mm-hmm. So uh, it seems sort of like a match made in heaven, right? Considering both of your loves for baseball. But how did you two get connected for this project? You want to take it, Anika? 
Uh, I, I mean, I'm happy to, but it's going to be a really short answer. I actually have no idea. <laughs> oh, I, um, oh, I, mean, I think I, my publisher knew you somehow. Okay. So okay. yeah, we we never met. It makes sense because we've kind of like been, uh, you know, operating in these, all the there's world. like all these little Venn diagram slivers that we kind of uh, cross over. So um, I, I think it just makes sense, but I was really excited when my agent, um, called me and she's like, so there's this, um, this publisher reached out. She's like, uh, it's, it's like a smarty. Let me see. She was like, looking at her notes. I'm like, smarty, Marty. <laughs> I know who that is. Yes, please. Um, Aww. yeah. So I was pretty excited. I love the drop of the Venn diagram, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I use that analogy all the time only because that's just like my whole brain is just one large, like mandala Venn diagram of like, there's, I, I love when things cross over and, and I, I think that's kind of, I guess my career also is like the moment when baseball crossed over art, crossed over storytelling, crossed over comedy, you know, there's like this little spot in the middle where, um, I don't know. I just feel like that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about the process of this. So Amy, you're, you're writing the book or you've written the book and then Anika jumps on to then illustrate it. How does that work? Because I love that the first page that I saw, the illustration is so wonderful because there's a nod to Tony Stone. There's the Rockford Peaches on a calendar. There's a Sporting Green headline about, you know, the first woman coach. So how does that all come together? So that's all Anika. I just put the words on a page. So I kind of have the story in my head of where I want her to go. You know, in the in the very first publication, it's about Marty teaching her little brother Mikey how to love baseball through scoring baseball. So it's super educational. It's it's really scoring centric and pages on how to, you know, score a single or a home run and um really be able to take that and then apply it to a game because the original thought was what I was seeing at the ballpark was not much interaction between people and they're on their phones and, and scoring is this kind of lost art that I have done since I was four years old, sitting next to my mom, watching my brother play. And it's a way to really be engaged in baseball. And, and you'll see a lot of people say baseball's boring. It's too long. It's kind of slow. And, you know, they're missing the whole magic of a slow game means it's a pitcher's duel. So, you know, like <laughs> it's those kinds of things that I'm trying to get across to kids to excite them. And then we started moving more into the, the gender stereotypes where in the second book, she gets an opportunity to call a game as a PA announcer and a play-by-play -play announcer and dealing with people not thinking she's qualified for that. And then we've moved on to this, but the pictures, the illustrations are its own story. And so really the onus is kind of on Anika, in my opinion, where I give her the words and a lot of my words can be taken out because of the illustration, being able to tell so much of the story. That's why children's books, you know, are kind of are short and concise because the illustrations are are truly the story. So I'm just so glad she's on the project because she made the book come to life. And all of those are from her diagram crossing over <laughs> brain. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting to me, Amy, that you never planned on making children's books. Uh, how did you, what kind of research do you do for that? Because writing is hard enough on its own, but now you're trying to reach out to, you know, six to nine year olds. Uh, so how do you figure out the right tone for something like that when it wasn't your, you know, you weren't planning on doing this from the begin beginning. And Anika, if you can follow up by describing if you had a different approach to illustrating this because of the two prior books. So I think I'm notorious for doing things I don't know how to do. I mean, let's just start with being a Giants in-game reporter for 13 seasons. It was never on my radar ever <laughs> to be covering baseball. I, I mean, I was a hard news producer. That's kind of what I saw myself doing. I studied communications at Davis. I went, I interned at CNN. Like that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bust people, right? <laughs> and so somehow I ended up telling sports stories. So I think I kind of just have that approach in general where, hmm, I don't know how to do this. But at the time I had two little kids. I was reading children's books 
all the time and found like they were my best audience and kind of test cases to what kept their attention and what didn't. And I also had my own personal experience of watching my children, especially my son, who's now going to be 20 this year. Oh my God. Wow. Really not. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not oh. like, <laughs> Well, do we want to go into hell or <laughs> <Long diagram. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it went like that, but he was, let's see in 2012, he would have been uh, seven years old. So in taking him to a game was a little bit of a nightmare. He just had no attention span. He wasn't interested. It was boring, but when he scored, he gave me a good six innings, you know, like I, I, he was into it. And so giving kids this kind of tangible project while they're at this event really was in my head as to how we could start this. Once that launched, then I was able to start to kind of really dive into my own story and the things that, that I struggled with, but be able to say it in a, in a, in a way that I couldn't say it as an adult. And I couldn't say it as a team representative and an NBC employee, but I could say it through this 10 year old girl's voice of what she was dealing with and let people kind of make their own decisions from there. So I never felt I was qualified. I, I do that to myself all the time. I never think I'm qualified for anything, but heck yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. And nine times out of 10, something really good comes out of it. And this book has been, um, you know, this storyline, this character has been really one of the the greatest rewards I could have received in my career to go around to children's schools and speak to them and read to them. And there is no tougher audience than, you know, 308 year olds looking at you <laughs> expecting to be entertained. And so those are always really fun to do, but to see the impact that it's had and the evolution that it's had over uh, the mindset of children, you know, and when I first started, like, really still trying to get a girl accepted in baseball was not there. It was on the cusp. I was pretty, I was pretty ahead of this trend that we're seeing now, Yes, but it was my life. I was always involved. My dad coached baseball. He threw me into every practice. He threw me into every drill. Like he was basically, you know, in, in charge of me. And so he threw me out there to, to, to play ball with the boys. And um, so I wanted to, to, you know, share that experience. So uh, was I qualified to do it? How did I take it on? I just said, you know what? I'll tell my story. And that's how I approached it. You know, it's so funny. I love, I love slash hate hearing um, other women who do amazing things talk about not feeling qualified because I feel like, you know, we all relate to that. Like, oh, none of us feel qualified. But then it's like, you look to your left and you're like, why does every man just like assume they're qualified all the time? Like, how is this? Okay. I realize this mentality of mine is like a product of something <laughs> different. So I, I love that we all relate to that, but I, at the same time, I, I don't love it. But, um, I think in a lot of ways though, it's what makes us do like really great stuff because we just like fight harder and work harder and we don't presume that we know how to do anything. So we learn the ins and the outs and we, we end up being better at it <laughs> than, than a lot of people who presume they, they are good at something or they know how to do it. And I was so excited to do this because, okay, I, I, I really love the illustrations in the previous Smarty Marty book. And the, and again, like the topic was more about scoring and Marty kind of getting her little brother interested. So, you know, it was, it was a, a bit of a different book and a different situation. But when they reached out to me um, about this, I was like, <laughs> I was like, finally, it's on because like it, this one is definitely more of Amy's story. And I felt like, like, there, especially when it comes to baseball, um, you know, there's a lot of like gatekeeping going on in a lot of, in a lot of industries. But um, I think we can all agree that not only is baseball like very male dominated, it's very white male dominated and the storytellers, um, are not necessarily the people who like, they might be qualified at telling stories and they might know a lot about baseball. I think that's kind of like where they're coming from is baseball is my, my terrain baseball. I love baseball so much. And it's been such a part of my life and it's this tradition in my family and everything. So, so therefore it's my territory and everything that falls within that is within my territory. So they end up telling stories that like the actual person's life or the actual story is not something they're qualified to tell. 
like they can't possibly know what it was like to be Jackie Robinson in that moment, but they're going to write all about it, you know, and that's fine. That information should be out there. And, you know, I don't want to say it's fine. Actually, it's not fine, but it has been fine. We've made it fine because that's, you know, that's how information gets out there um, to begin with. But then we need, then we go a little bit deeper. And so, you know, when I wrote a book about women who played baseball, different book, we don't have to talk about that, but I learned so much about what they dealt with and they're coming up in and in a totally different time. And that was like 80 years ago. And so much of like Amy's own story and stories I hear of women in baseball um, who are playing right now, it was like, wow, I've, I've spoken to women who played 80 years ago and I'm speaking to women who are in baseball now. And <laughs> there's like, mm, like very small differences, if anything. Um, but now we're seeing a lot more women in positions that can, that have the opportunity to pull other women up, keep the doors open, advocate. Um, you know, it takes, it takes men doing that in the beginning. And then once you get through your whole job is to hold the door open. And this is my very, very, very long way of saying, I felt excited and, and qualified, I guess, to help Amy tell the story of lots of other women like that. So, um, it was really exciting to not only be able to just illustrate about a girl playing baseball, but to have enough, uh, knowledge back here to put that into the storytelling so like the bedroom with tony stone like uh the thing of tony stone and the rocker key it was like <laughs> my favorite thing about illustrating is easter eggs and like planning little you know and so that was my i was like oh this is like this is where she gets to be a fan of other girls and women who play baseball and like as much as we all love our our major league players like I really wanted those things to stand out like she was gonna be the kind of girl who got to a place and then was excited to leave the door open for other girls to do it too um in my mind I mean we don't you know she's she's a kid <laughs> she she's going one step at a time but I wanted to kind of present that you know plant that seed so there's even a, a young girl on a wheelchair who um <clears throat> Uh, like obviously in the beginning I have her kind of expressing interest of keeping score with her brother and that's her brother in case I'm wrong and then um, and then she ends up calling the game in the PA booth when Marty steps up and and manages and I I don't know that's it's these little these little visual storytelling things that people may or may not pick up on it's fun to think of of a kid reading that and picking up on that and understanding the the storyline that's not being told I would just add what Anika is so amazing at is doing the subset story, you know, within the, within the larger story. And when you are the author, you kind of hand over your words and see what comes back to you. And, and in times past, there have been changes, tweaks, we need more diversity. We, you know, whatever it is, none of that had to happen with Anika. If you, if you look at the book, I think, you know, we tried to represent um, all genders, all races, um, the, and what you said, Anika, about men helping break down those barriers for women, you know, the manager that asks Marty to step in for him is, uh, you know, a black man. It's a, it's a man of color, um, which we aren't seeing represented in Major League Baseball enough. So that was one of my favorite parts in getting the illustrations back was this complete and total um, inclusiveness that Anika just broods. I mean, it just kind of comes out of her. So um, I was the lucky recipient of being able to add that into this storyline and just broaden it so much more. I think we're all of a certain age in this group and we have, <laughs> I'm just going to say it out loud. The hot and we, age. Yeah, hot, <laughs> hot, bitch, hot bitches age. I mature. Don't know. Mature. Um, mature. 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 Um, but, you know, we, we've been watching sports for forever. Um, Ange loves basketball. I grew up a Giants fan. I'm born and raised here. Like, used to go to Candlestick, all the things. But finally, women are making their way to the top. Women's sports is just, like, on everyone's mind, I feel. And I just want to know from both of you, since you're in it, it's the Venn diagrams. I'll start with Amy, <laughs> Amy G., yeah. What is it? What do you feel right now with women's women's sports and just uh, finally being popular and being talked about like every day? 
Well, I kind of, I'm going to might maybe steal what Anika said. Like I love it and I hate it. Right. Like it's this kind of conundrum having been an athlete playing collegiate volleyball, having it be my career and seeing for all of these years, the amazing stories that lie within females and sports. And besides all of the amazing benefits you're seeing happen for girls who play sports and graduation rates and, and confidence and all the things that it, that it lends to. And that's not just in sports. That's like just getting girls involved, right? Like I want to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. like if you're into music or knitting or something. It's like having a community gives you confidence and sports did that for me. And so I'm a huge advocate. Um, but the, so it makes me kind of sad. It's taken people this long to see it and to enjoy it and to be a part of it because it's exhilarating. And then I'm thrilled at where it's going. And I only see it like finally hitting a level where it's going to stabilize. Like we've seen big moments in women's sports. If we go back to, you know, the, the um, 99ers, the the women's uh, team that that won the Olympics, that won the World Cup, Brandi Chastain. We thought at that moment in 1999, we had broken through and we're here 25 years later and we're still battling for, you know, equality and pay and, and Megan Rapino having to um, really sacrifice herself and, and all of the good and bad that comes with being a spokesperson for that, um, that you know, it just takes a really long time to see progress. I think that's probably the biggest lesson I'm taking away from all of this is we are seeing change. We're seeing positive change, but it takes a really long time for minor changes to happen. And then all of a sudden it's a big one. And my favorite thing, I'm doing this Olympics coverage for our local radio station. So I've got, I'm glued in like 24 seven and it's, Same. it's so, so are we <laughs> right it's so it's, much though it's so it's much so it's, much it's, it's I'm, crazy i'm but already the, overwhelmed i know but what's so fun is you know celebrity sightings is this big thing they're yeah. all at the women's events mm -hmm. all of them so flavor flav with the women's water polo team and snoop love and simone and tom cruise love and simone and jessica chastain is at the women's gymnastics event and uh, jill biden's going to the dr jill biden's at the water polo so uh, you know that's what the post was it was this carousel of all of these big names you supporting and wanting to get a ticket to a women's event nothing against the men but it's just that's right now now you're catching on mm -hmm. so it's been pretty fun to watch. That's what's so funny for me also, as Aaron said, because we are women of a certain age, we have, you know, this sort of angst about like, you know, all the things that we had to go through to break glass ceilings, like the both of you. But when I talk to my goddaughters are eight and they're, they're fearless and they play all the sports and they have no limits. They're not growing up the same way we are. So that's what also gives me hope is like, oh wait, they're, they don't have this chip on their shoulder that I have. So that gives me hope too. But that chip on your shoulder is what's driven you. And I think it was necessary for our generation to have it, to take the stance and to to continue to grind. I'm going to tell this really quick story. We talk about your, your godchildren are eight. So that's the audience that I go to and speak at these schools. And it is the best feeling, especially like right now. And we're in a lot of political turmoil, right? And you're like, what mm -hmm. is going to happen? And I have a 16 year old daughter. So I'm like, Ooh, right. These kids are eight. And I say, oh, you know, how many kids play baseball? And they all, all raise their hand. And I go, all right, how many girls play baseball? Well, and they all keep their hand up. I go, not softball, baseball. And some hands go down. And now we've got, you know, a, a, a good amount of hands still up. And I, say, and I said, do you know when I was your age, if I wanted to play baseball, I couldn't. And they go, oh, oh. you know, boys and girls why? They always say why. And I said, because I was a girl and this one girl in the back, she goes, well, that's stupid, you know, <laughs> and the women think it's stupid. And so here we are with this next generation coming up, really, truly seeing, you know, equity and knowing that it's possible. And this Olympics, you guys, this Olympics is the first gender, um, has gender parity. So it's 5,250 men and 5,250 women are competing. It's the first Olympic games with wow. complete gender parity. So there it's possible, wow. you know, it is possible. And we're seeing these things and it's important to note those things, even though 
we are a little bitter that it, you know, it's taking so long and we didn't maybe receive the effects of it. But I think of my mom who didn't have title nine, like sports wasn't even really an option for her, but it was for me. So you look along the generations and, and the progress that's been made, you just keep pushing. So you're saying they owe us. That's what, that's what I'm going <laughs> for. They, they owe, owe us big us time. A lot, Angela. It is a lot. <laughs> My daughter Y'all, knows it too. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all better be changing our diapers. That's all. Uh-huh. <laughs> we changed yeah. yours. A drink, so payback some dinner, maybe. Pitch, yeah. Right? Put on your bitch <laughs> talk. Payback is yeah. a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love it. I do want to tag on that. I, I think the the most exciting part is is twofold it's watching women advance to places they haven't been but it's the way that they're doing it which which is kind of like it's not just like a kick in the face of patriarchy it's also um just kind of an f you to capitalism because Mm -hmm. it's crazy to me that really like sexism and misogyny has um they, they've they created this myth around it that it's not lucrative like so women's sport, nobody they they just straight out said without knowing nobody watches women play sports so therefore you can't make money off of it as if that's like the whole reason that sports exists which now it has <laughs> way too much to do with it but um <laughs> i mean yeah but you know and and now every every major sports team is a business you know we as fans we see it as a team but the people who are running it see it as a business and they make moves rooted in business rather than in, you know, thinking about the fans and the team. And I don't know, I just feel like so often we're like let down as fans by these like business decisions. And, um, I, you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll probably, how we'll know we made it as women is when that starts happening to us (laughs) in that, in that, on that (laughs) level where it's like, we're such a business that we are back to not being treated as humans where where we're just kind of like lingering right now. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Commodified. But, um, the, the, the things that have kind of like shot women's sports out of this, like canon in all these little sort of seemingly disconnected places is women just being like, well, screw this. Actually, I don't know why you're telling me that nobody's watching this. I'm watching this and it's amazing. And these women are amazing. And there are places like, um, like the sports bra in Portland, nothing gives me greater joy than not only seeing them succeed, but seeing them succeed at such a level that now there are like, I don't want to say copycats because it's not, they're not taking anything away from them, but just like it's done so well that there's actually even one opening in Nashville, which like is like blowing my mind with that, that, right. that they're, that they are, uh, you know, confident enough that that can happen there. And I think it can, I think, it, I think the, the, thing that's so dumb is it can happen anywhere it's just that people it's don't also it is happening that. it is happening yeah. it's happening exactly in so anyways <laughs> and it's just well and I think they that these kind of pockets have a lot to do with this this like upwelling of talent and money and so now the next challenge is like because there's just always this mentality of like well only one can get in like okay a woman got in like, there you go. You're welcome. Like, oh, a black woman got in. Oh, well, you're double welcome. You know, now one of you has to get out. <laughs> and so like now that they're they're getting in, um, now the major challenge is like, okay, well, we're here. When are you going to like pay us? When are we going to get the same training facilities? Like, when are we not going to have this rack of five pound weights? When are we going to have, you know, and it's funny to like speak on all this because I am so not athletic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not, if you were, I'm not you would want the best equipment. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, like I have two little five pound weights of my own, but, um, <laughs> you know, this is not me, but I, 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 as a fan, it's, you know, my early realization of like, wow, all of my art that's based in baseball is, um, there are like no girls or women in these images and I want to change that. And now here we are. And just, just seeing, um, like, on all levels too. Like we're, we're talking about like, um, women's sports in the Olympics and, uh, WNBA and now in baseball, but like, uh, I attended a few of the baseball for all national competitions, like in previous years. And it was really cool. I was like, Oh my gosh, look at all these girls playing baseball. And it'd be like, you know, seven or eight teams. And 
it, it was just kind of like a very homegrown, like really had to raise money and do bake sales and things to bring them there. And I was just there last month um, at a baseball for all national tournament in Kentucky. And I was like blown away. Um, it was like a full on massive, I mean, families on families. I had a hard time finding a parking spot when I got there. Um, it was incredible. There were so many girls of varying eight from like six to 17, I think is like something like that, um, playing baseball and just like on multiple fields at the same time, it was like a music festival, like, like who's <laughs> playing over here, who's playing over here. Hmm. Um, and I was like rushing different, you know, different games. Um, they were killing it. And that just made me so happy to see that, like, um, like you were saying opportunity that that's the gift that it presents is possibility. Like it's not just representing it to, to check a box. It's representing because like, that's the gift that you are giving to people coming up is the gift of possibility for them to see it. So I hope like the girl in, in the classroom that was like, well, that's stupid. I'm just like, I immediately <laughs> was thinking, I can't wait for the day when someone is talking about like, you know, when I was growing up, there were no women as president of the United States or there were, you know, and some <laughs> kid going, well, that's stupid. No like way. things mm -hmm. like that. I just can't wait. So it's exciting yeah. to kind of be in like the, you know, the bridge generation of watching it all happen. Well, and I was going to say the Olympics at this time, it couldn't have come at a better time because we have kind of the mainstream sports that we're watching women, especially with Caitlin Clark, and you've got, you know, mm -hmm. Simone Biles and these big names in very popular female sports, but we're getting to know other characters now in sports that aren't as watched. And, you know, right now for me, I'm obsessed with uh, Ilona Marr of the women's rugby sevens team. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. a, she's a beast. Nobody can stop her. And to be able to, 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 you know, watch, uh, you know, women, uh, uh, a female won a silver medal in mountain biking, which is like the highest ranked medal the U S has ever, ever had in that sport. And that, you know, mountain biking doesn't get a lot of love. Rugby doesn't get a lot of love because we don't grow up with it here. So it's the perfect time to expose other sports and find favorites, find female favorites within these sports that we can follow and that they're popular. And I love, again, back to the help of men, like Snoop Dogg and, and Flavor Flav, like <laughs> who, who could have scripted this, right? I mean, it's hilarious. Love that that's it's, the men. The <laughs> and, and men, of, men of color. <laughs> and men of color who are just like, you got it, girl. Like, I'm going to watch you because, because you're a badass bitch. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, just all, all of that happening right now is, uh, so phenomenal to watch. And I love that we're getting to see women that we haven't heard of who have mm -hmm. just as great of a story, you know, and, um, maybe bring some popularity to their sport and fundraising and money to their sport to keep it going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, before we wrap up, because it's been like way more than 15 minutes. So thank you so much <laughs> for your time. <laughs> I, again, I could talk for another 25 minutes about this at least. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about because I'm a Bay Area native, born and raised, uh, Giants fan. I worked at the Giants for a few seasons way early on, way, way before you, Amy. <laughs> I was there before you. <laughs> <laughs> OG. But um, I want to talk about the legacy of Rennell. I grew up listening to her on KMEL. She's on the Morning Zoo crew. She's just been in my sphere for forever. So just for both of you as Giants fans, what's the, and Amy, you worked with her. So what's the legacy for you? Because I think she's got more to give somewhere else. So Rennell, for me, I'm the same. Grew up listening to her on the radio. And then when I started with Fox Sports Net Bay Area, I was not on camera. I was behind the scenes and I was a producer and Rennell was my talent. And so she would come into the office and we'd do voiceovers. And then she hosted the Giants pregame show of which I produced or produced features. And I needed her to, to work with me on it. And so we became friends back in 2004 is when I started. So we've been friends for 20 years. And really, it's one of those where I always tell people, be careful when you meet your heroes, because you don't want to be disappointed. And it was so far from that for me, that she surpassed all expectations I've ha I had of who I thought she would be, how fun I thought she would be. I mean, <laughs> she's she's beyond fun. Uh, we got to do a White House trip together and um, wow. have, 
have a few cocktails on that flight and beyond. And, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was pregnant with my son in 2004, I was producing for her and, uh, showing, and she just came up and put her hands on me and said, put her head down to my stomach. She goes, it's auntie Nellie. And I love your mama, you know, and she's just been really the, 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 the pinnacle of mentorship for me. And in an, in an industry, you're not getting that from a lot of women who were there before you, especially in kind of our time frame where you really felt competition with anyone when you were coming in that, are you trying to take my job? And, you know, and, and I wasn't, you know, I was just trying to have a job. I was literally just trying to pay my mortgage and I tried to learn various skill sets to be able to do that. And so when I landed the in-game reporting position with the Giants, like the first person I heard from was Renelle. Like she was just genuinely proud of me and she's always been uh, a, a mentor to me. But beyond that, she became a really good friend. And we both have experienced some turmoil in our careers in the last few years and changes to something that was so regular and just very defined for us for a very long time. And I love that I will forever be linked to her. I love I'll forever have her in my life. And there is no question in my mind that she will end up on top. My knowledge of Renelle before and after having any personal contact with her um, has just been that she exudes what Amy was talking about. She exudes a nurturing nature and you can see that in everything that she had, like when she talks about um, players, the way she talks about, like the way she talked about Lamont Wade Jr., the way she talks <laughs> about, um, uh, my partner and I went in Nashville to see Tony, Tony, Tony at the Ryman. And like, mm. she posted about it a couple days later when she went to see them, but it was like in such a, like my boys and my, like, she, like she watched them come up and she was so proud. And uh, mm. <laughs> it was like, wow, you know, it, it's, um, her reach but she's not a you know it's not a showy thing she she has a relationship this like wide-reaching relationship with so many people and I think everyone would use that word a relationship because she um, has this incredible gift where she not only personally connects with people but then she's like so generous with how she connects with people um, she's been really generous with me without really even knowing me um, and I think that's like such a valuable asset to have as part of um, a team, a family, a business, um, whatever it is that you have, I feel like if you have someone like Ronell, if you have Ronell, um, you have like such a tremendous asset in the ability to create that warmth and that connection and that mentorship and that generosity. Um, so what's really cool is that even though, uh, I mean, without diving into the circumstances, but even though she's no longer with the Giants, she carries all of those qualities and assets with her. None of them actually belong to the team that she dedicated so many years of her life to. They belong to the fans um, in, in that they're touched by them. And that's why we love her so much. Um, but she takes those with her. It's like, it's like taking your entire like client list file with you when you go to start your own business or something. It's like, bye, you know, um, she gets to take all that with her and bring it somewhere else. And wherever she brings it, it's like, it, she's going to shine. Um, and I'm sure it's been like really difficult for her to feel like, um, she wants to again, but you know, I think she will, I hope she will realize that, um, her identity is, um, what she has made of it and it's it's so beautiful that it was so tied with the giants but her identity is not that baseball team her identity is Rennell and she brought that light to KML to the giants to wherever she goes next um she's the brand she's the identity she's the human so I can't wait to see what she does next I think yeah that's the best point anybody could make and a really hard lesson for women, you know, especially in, in my age at 50, where you've done something for so long that your identity seems to get defined for mm -hmm. you. And you forget that your identity is, is the light that you bring and what, you know, your special twist on things. And, um, you know, I, I've gone through it and I know she's going through it. And it, I think what Anika said is just so completely spot on that Renell 
is what is special in it. And, 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 you know, 24 years with the giants, I, I covered the giants in game for 13 seasons and I'm still with the giants. Um, and they're a very special organization. I would never, um, you know, disparage them in any way, but at the end of the day, Ronell is who she is because of who she is. Um, and the, the giants were a compliment to her, but, um, all that she is, 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 really one of the most unique, talented, smart, giving, um, really a, she's a champion for people. She's all of those things within herself. And, um, hopefully she'll hear this and, and have that going forward because she needs to hear it more. Agreed. Mm -hmm. She's a legend, living legend. She is. She is a um, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your time, both of you. This has been lovely. And, uh, you know, we should do panels or something. Anyways, <laughs> talk about women's sports. Panels and drinks. Right. Panels, panels and drinks. Panels and panels. Yeah. Panels and drinks. Panels yeah. and drinks. Yes. The first, they have to read the book. They read yes. the book. And then, well, yeah. Quick well, the book, is, the book is Smarty Marty Takes the Field. Um, we were speaking with the author, Amy Gutierrez, also known as Amy G, and the illustrator, Anika Orak. So thank you so much for being on Bitch Talk. You both are bad bitches. And, uh, Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you both so much. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.